most people realize the evil roots of Halloween and how it emphasizes what's gory and grotesque. But very few people consider that the next two days have just as much darkness and deception attached to them. Why would I say that? November 1st is All Saints Day. November 2nd is All Souls Day. And you need to understand what that really means. On this podcast episode, I'm going to be pulling back the veil. Three days of darkness and deception. That's what I'm going to focus on. Three days, October 31st, November 1st, and November 2nd. Halloween, All Saints Day, and All Souls Day. But first, let me tell you a story from Exodus chapter 10. There were 10 plagues that Moses prophesied would come upon Egypt, and the ninth plague was the plague of darkness. And God told him to stretch forth his hand over Egypt and proclaim darkness over all the land that was so deep that it could be felt. And for three days, the Egyptians did not leave their homes, but the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Now we're coming up, spiritually speaking, to three days where darkness and deception are going to cover the world in very significant ways. But those who understand biblical truth and those who have insights into the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven have light in their dwellings. And if you're not sure of some things, I pray that this podcast episode lights the wick of the lamp of truth in your heart so that you have light in your dwelling. Well, first of all, let's focus for a few moments on Halloween. I'm not going to spend much time because you probably heard other exposés on what Halloween is all about, but just to lay the foundation Yes, it's much more than masquerading about in costumes and children knocking on doors saying trick-or-treat and gathering a whole bag full of candy, which seems completely innocent. But it's like a front for something that's very sinister behind the scenes. It's a facade that makes people feel comfortable participating in it, and yet there's evil lurking in the darkness behind the scenes, in the historical past. Because if you follow it back to its roots, you'll find out that Halloween began as an ancient pagan tradition that was celebrated by the Druid priests in Britain and Ireland many years ago, many decades, centuries ago. It did include wearing costumes. They would primarily wear animal skins and wear animal heads, but it wasn't for fun, <laughs> quite the opposite. It was to ward off evil ghosts and evil spirits. Even to this day, witches and Wiccans believe that it is a time that is especially helpful because to their purposes, especially helpful to their occult practices because they believe the veil between this world and the realm of spirits, the realm of the dead, is the thinnest and most penetrable on October 31st. So there are many Wiccan celebrations going on. Witchcraft covens are meeting all over the world because they feel that's the high holy day of the year. Satanists believe Halloween is the high unholy day, rather. Not the high holy day, but the high unholy day of the year. Why unholy? Because it's as separate from the things of God as it can be. And I believe there's a lot more than just the gruesome images of skeletons and gravestones and spiders and snakes associated with Halloween. I think there's some very, very dark. I don't just think, I know that there are some very, very dark things going on in satanic ceremonies that would horrify people if they really knew about it. So that's Halloween, but let's move past that to November 1st. Oh, you may think relief because November 1st is All Saints Day. 
or at least it's been celebrated as All Saints Day by the Catholic Church and several other denominations. What could be wrong with that? That sounds like a welcome change from Halloween, right? Well, it's connected to Halloween because the very word Halloween comes from root words, All Hallows Eve. And that meant the evening before All Saints Day, because Hallows means either holy or saint. And when you say All Hallows Day, or All Hallows Eve, rather, is the evening before the day when the saints are celebrated. Now, what is a saint? A saint, biblically defined, is someone who has been sanctified, someone who has been cleansed from the defilement of evil, made holy in the sight of God, and consecrated to God's purposes. And in the Bible, all of his people are referred to as saints. But the Catholic Church evolved through the centuries to the point where in 993, 993 AD, Pope John the 15th canonized the first saint, and that was Saint Ulrich. So this was not a practice in the early church. All the church members were called saints. Over and over again, you can find it in the epistles. Paul writes the church at Ephesus to the saints that are in Ephesus, or to the saints that are at Philippi, or to the saints that are at Thessalonica. They were all considered to be cleansed from the defilement of sin, made holy and separated unto God for his purposes. But then through the centuries, it came to mean someone who, who reached a high degree of piety and virtue, heroic virtue is a phrase that's used in Catholicism. And it developed to the point where, well, in 1234 AD, over a thousand years after the birth of the church, the formal canonization process began where it was structured and it was defined within Catholicism, where they knew that the Pope alone had authority to pronounce someone a saint. And then that person had to be proven by two post-mortem miracles being worked by those who appealed to that saint to pray in their behalf. In other words, two miracles have to be attributed to that saint praying to God, God working the miracle, but the saint being involved in the intercessory process. And thus the whole thing began. Well, why do I think that's wrong? I've done an entire episode on this, and you should go back and, and listen to it if you're interested in digging deeper. But let me give some basic information. First of all, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, God, in no uncertain terms, commanded his people never to attempt contacting the dead. Listen to Deuteronomy 18 verses 9 through 14. When you come into the land which the Lord your God has given you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. And the word abomination means something extremely detestable in the sight of God. Verse 10, there shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire. They didn't have abortion clinics back then, so they got rid of unwanted children by giving them to their gods in a sacrificial way, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. The King James Version says, who practices necromancy, or a necromancer, and that's someone who tries to call up the dead. Listen to the next verse. For all, not most, but all who do such things are an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God for these nations which you will dispossess. Listen to soothsayers and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed you for such. Hmm, those are strong, strong words. Why would I associate that with asking a saint in heaven, supposedly in heaven, to intercede in your behalf? 
because you're trying to contact the dead. Saul was stressed out because he was being attacked by an enemy army and God wasn't answering him anymore. And so he went to the witch at Endor. You can read about this in 1 Samuel chapter 18. And, and he disguised himself so she wouldn't know the king was visiting her because he had given orders previously for all witches in the land to be executed. Hmm. That was an intense time to live for someone indulging in those dark crafts. And so she would not have been comfortable talking to the king because she would have thought she was going to be taken and stoned. But anyway, Saul went to the witch at Endor and he asked her to call up Samuel the prophet for him. Now, if anyone could have been considered a saint out of the Old Testament, it was Samuel because he, of all the Old Testament persons that were in positions of authority, had a somewhat flawless record, a very flawless record. So he would have been considered a saint by that standard, by that modern standard even. And so he was just trying to call on a saint. What could be wrong with that? Well, it brought such judgment on Saul that within 24 hours, he and his sons were dead in the battle. And he evidently transgressed against God by doing so. So why would something so wrong then be perfectly acceptable and right now? It's not. It is not right. And it is a transgression of the word of God. Because as I mentioned, all believers are saints. Now, the Catholic Catechism actually admits that. In Paragraph 946, it says, what is the church if not the assembly of all the saints? The communion of saints is the church. But the Catholic Church also believes that there's saints in the earth, saints in purgatory, and saints in heaven. And the communion of the saints is the interaction between those three, uh, those that are dwelling in those three places. And, and so they feel that it's, it's advantageous for someone who is still on a journey through the realm of time to contact saints in heaven for their intercession. Now, why do I not believe in that? Well, first of all, because it's not biblical. You cannot find one biblical example. If you do a word search for the word pray or prayed or prayer, through the entire Bible, you'll never find a time where someone prayed to anything or anyone other than the true God unless they were committing the sin of idolatry, unless they were apostate. It is not a biblically revealed practice. It's wrong. But logistically, it doesn't make any sense either. Because just suppose on All Saints Day, when Catholics and people of other belief systems too. But when Catholics are encouraged to seek a connection with their patron saints and, and with the other saints that are revered to intercede in their behalf, what if uh, one-tenth of all Catholics prayed to St. Peter that day? Okay, so there's 1.3 billion Catholics in the world. That means 130 million people are talking to Peter in one day, All Saints Day. Well, you break that down by 1,440, that's the number of minutes in a day, and you've got over 90,000 people talking to Peter about their situation, their unique individual problem, and asking for him to intercede in their behalf. So he would have to be fully cognizant of all the details of their personal lives making it necessary for him to be omnipresent and omniscient in order to process over 90,000 requests at one time. And within a split second, there's 90,000 more contacting him. Three seconds, 90,000 more contacting him. Only God could handle that kind of influx of, of prayers going up to him. Now, God is omniscient. God is omnipotent. But those two attributes can't be given to anyone else but him, no one else. Moreover, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, and that's the man, Christ Jesus. Now, I've seen Catholic responses to that 
where they say, well, if, if you say we should only go to Jesus, then you should never ask a fellow Christian to pray for you. Well, the thing is, we are encouraged in the Bible to get fellow Christians to pray for us one-on-one, -on -one, asking a brother in the Lord, a sister in the Lord to intercede in your behalf. We're encouraged to do that, but we are not only discouraged, but we are commanded not to try and contact the dead. And so there's a huge leap between asking a fellow believer to pray and trying to penetrate the veil that is spread over all nations, the covering that's cast over all people that prevents interaction between the two worlds. Uh, now, if God chose to, he could allow a prophet or a saint to manifest in someone's dream, maybe, like he did with John the Revelator in that vision that he received. The prophet spoke to him toward the end of the dream, or the vision, rather. But uh, that was expressively at the will of God. It wasn't something that John experienced because he involved himself in some kind of esoteric ritual, some kind of a cult ritual that was supposed to open up the spiritual world to him. It was directly at the will of God. And such a thing is extremely, extremely, extremely rare, I'm sure. Next, All Souls Day, November 2nd. What's wrong with All Souls Day? It's a time to remember those who have departed, yeah, those who have lived, especially loved ones. It's a time to remember them, kind of a memorial day for them, but specifically within the worldview of Catholicism and some other, uh, some other Christian groups also, they believe it's a time to specifically focus on praying your loved ones and friends out of purgatory. And purgatory is supposedly a temporary realm of suffering and purging, a realm of agony, yes, but an, a realm of cleansing where it prepares you for the spectacular holiness and beauty of heaven. Because Catholics, and again, I, I did another podcast on purgatory where I go into much more detail. I urge you to listen to that or get the book, The Beliefs of the Catholic Church. There's a whole chapter devoted to purgatory, and also there's a chapter uh, devoted to indulgences, which are things that Catholics can do in order to hasten a person's exit from purgatory. But what is it all about? Well, of course, the word purgatory, the root of it is the word purge. It means a time of being purged of lesser sins, lesser failings, lesser faults. In Catholicism, they're called venial sins. If you die with venial sins that are unconfessed, then you might have to spend time in purgatory in order to burn them off, so to speak. Or even if you have been forgiven of mortal sins, which are the most grievous sins, according to Catholic doctrine, you still have to go through temporal punishment, temporary punishment, for those sins that you committed as a consequence of the evil that was wrought in your life. I personally believe that when you go to God in repentance, you are justified. And the Bible says you're justified by faith, justified in the name of the Lord, justified by the Spirit of God. You are justified by the blood that Jesus shed. And the word justified means legally acquitted of all guilt, just as if you never sinned. I do not believe in such a concept. The early church did not teach purgatory. Jesus did not teach purgatory. It did not become an established doctrine or dogma in the Catholic Church until the year 1274 AD. Again, over a thousand years from the birth of the church, this idea evolves to the point where it's totally accepted and pronounced as irrefutable doctrine. And in the catechism, or in its stance on what purgatory is when it was finally established at the Second Council of Lyon in 1274 AD. During that council, they defined purgatory in the most simplistic terms 
They said, number one, some souls are purified after death, and number two, such souls benefit from the prayers and pious duties that the living do for them, period. That's not much of an explanation for something that intense. And according to the Catechism, paragraph 1031, purgatory is for the final purification of the elect. And the word elect means chosen. If you're chosen by God, See, the purgatory is not for your ordinary human beings out there that are not religious at all. It's primarily for Catholics because to go to purgatory, you have to already have been dealing with your sins unless there, there is some provision possibly made for those who have never heard the story of Jesus, who have never been confronted with the claims of Catholicism through no fault of their own. God has a special way of dealing with them. But primarily, purgatory is for Catholics. And their go-to scripture, and I'm going to end with this one, their go-to scripture in order to prove the existence of purgatory is 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15. And this proves that uh, it's only for those that have already laid Jesus as the foundation of their lives. Not some nominal churchgoer that goes to church once every two years. But for those who have truly laid Jesus as the foundation of their lives, it says, No other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And now, if anyone builds on this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become clear. Each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. Yet he himself will be saved, yet so as by fire. Well, that sounds like purgatory, doesn't it? Being tried by fire. But it doesn't say it's for an extended period of time. Very clearly, it says, the day, capital letter D. Each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it. Not a purgatorial suffering that lasts for ages. But the day, day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. Well, the Bible says when Jesus comes again, he's going to come in flaming fire and all his holy angels. And the illumination will take place in a split second where God will illuminate our lives, all our words, all our attitudes, all our actions, determine what has eternal value, what was truly consecrated to him in alignment with his word and his will, that will obtain an eternal reward. But anything else in our lives that was wasted time on ritual ceremonies or traditions that were not of God, all of that will be burned up. But all of that happens the day of the Lord, not in some imaginary realm called purgatory. Well, there you have it, October 31st, which I prefer to call Reformation Day, because October 31st was the day when Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the door of the church in Wittenberg. But October 31st, Halloween, November 1st, All Saints Day, November 2nd, All Souls Day, the reason I believe they're days of darkness and deception is because all three days are filled with dark and deceptive doctrines. Halloween, yes, it's the worst, but November 1st and 2nd are very bad as well. You needed to know this, and I pray you'll pursue it even do deeper by going to our website, to catholicswithlove.org, and there's an article there on three days of darkness and deception.